Honorable members, colleagues and friends, so it's a, it's a pleasure for us in the EPRS to host this event, uh, which is marking uh, the end of a year of celebration of the 70 years of the Joint Assembly. And this event today is going to be dedicated to a very important topic, which is the 70 years of transnational groups in the European Parliament and how much groups, political groups, have been forging European democracy. And we're very honored to have with us uh, President Pöterich, who is here not as a former president, but as a former group chair of the EPP at the time. Hannes Svoboda, who was chair of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats. And also, Gaze de Vries, it was not called Renew at the time, it was called ALDE at the time, uh, ELDR even, group in the European Parliament. So, um, and this event is uh, on site here in our beautiful library reading room, but it's also uh, broadcasted online, and I greet also our audience online, and after that it will be also a uh, conversation that will be available for rewatch in YouTube. Um, the conversation today will be moderated by uh, Wolfram Kaiser, who is the head of our EP History Service, but before that we will have an introduction by uh, Vice President Sharon Sova, uh, Vice President Sharon Zova is uh, in the European Parliament, first elected in 2014. She's serving in her second mandate. She holds a doctorate degree from the University of Economics in Prague, and she's graduated from the Diplomatic Academy in Madrid. She is a diplomat by career, whose posting included the Czech permanent representation of the EU during the Czech presidency. She has also worked in Strasbourg in the Council of Europe. And in the European Parliament, uh, currently, Mrs. Sharanzova is a uh, member of the Renew uh, Group and Rapporteur for the Internal Market uh, and Consumer Protection Committee and also member in the International Trade Committee. So we are very honored to have you with us today. And please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, members of the European Parliament, former members. I'm very honored to kick off the discussion with you, with our distinguished guests. And uh, I have to say that uh, when I received the invitation, I was really surprised about the topic. Uh, we often speak these days about how to push the agenda forward, what we should do when it comes to internal market. We just celebrated 30 years anniversary of, of, uh, of the internal market of the European Union. But it's true that we should look also back how we created the structure, political structure uh, in Europe. And you said it very well this month marks 70 years anniversary of the Common Assembly of the European Coal and Steel Community, formalized the first transnational groups. So the currently existing groups are and remain the only truly transnational groups in a transnational parliament, in a supranational organization, the European Union with a set of common institutions and common legal system. Well, many here in Brussels likely think that the transnational character of the group is natural status of affairs, but this is just not true. Those that first come from a national or regional parliament, however, will find many of our structures, rules, practices, sometimes, sometimes opaque and in any case challenging, as they do not always match how the national parliament or national politics work. This was especially true during this term of the parliament, during the current parliamentary term. Six months uh, into it, the COVID pandemic hit our work in the European Parliament. So understanding European policy issues, getting to know each other, communicating between each other is, is especially difficult for the newly elected members of this, of this house. But we managed to switch our parliament to online uh, parliament. We voted for the first time online. We managed to run our business uh, online. And yes, this is the time to, to uh, remember what, what happened uh, also in the past, 70 years ago. Many issues were similar and uh, others different. 
For example, most self-selected delegated MEPs from the national parliaments were able to communicate with each other, mostly in French or also in German. English has gradually uh, developed into uh, the lingua franca of the European Parliament today, though I would say that it's uh, Brussels English, maybe for the native speaker, sometimes difficult even to follow, right? Um, but this is the, the, the reality. Uh, communication in the Common Assembly was facilitated by the fact that it was small, with only 78 parliamentarians from six member states, compared to 705 today from 27 member states. At the time in 1953, yeah. as a result of the initial exclusion of communists from Italy and France, only three groups were formed. They were the Christian Democrats, the Socialists and the Liberals. Although they have different compositions, they have changed their group names over time, these three groups still exist roughly in their original form. And for the moment, they are also still the largest three groups of the European Parliament. This is also the reason why we have one former chair of each of these groups on the podium today. Today's EPR's event is devoted to the origins and trajectories of these three groups and more generally to understanding how the roles and practices of all transnational groups have changed over time. The particular focus lies on the question of what some political scientists have termed the intrapreneurial leadership that their elected leaders have exercised and can exercise inside these transnational groups, parliamentary bodies with multiple functions ranging from the self-organization of MEPs, the allocation of resources, positions, structuring political debate, shaping the legislative process, to communicating with citizens, etc. Bodies, moreover, were as I can confirm from my own experience, different beliefs, culturally informed ways of doing things, language use and policy preferences can complicate the exercise of any form of leadership. Issues that can even include varying ways of understanding national or European history, of course. To help structure this event, the former group chairs have been sent a list of 12 orientation questions from which they can pick and choose for recounting their memories and reflecting on their role in their groups at the time when they lead, led it. Following the academic lecture, each former group chair has a maximum of 10 minutes to do so. As you know, we are very strict in the European Parliament when it comes to time allocation. And uh, you will have time also, of course, to take questions uh, from the floor, including from, from my colleagues and former MEPs. For the benefit of those watching us online, and I welcome all of you that are following us online, uh, I have been asked to read out those 12 questions. For those that you know already, please bear with me. First, what were and are the main motives for electing a chair, ranging from their party affiliation to intercultural, personal or generic leadership skills? Second, did it matter and does it matter if the group chair is from a small state with a smaller national delegation or a large member state with strong or dominant influence in the group? Third, what personal qualities were and are especially useful for leading a transnational group? For example, intercultural experience, language skills, communication skills, or the ability to be at ease at networking across borders. Fourth, did former group chairs practice forms of collective leadership together with vice chairs, rapporteurs, etc., and how did they structure such cooperation? 
Fifth, how did group chairs address ideological diversity in their group? What did they do to enhance voting cohesion, which is now very high for all three groups created in 1953? And how did they deal with rebels? Six, and something that I would be especially interested to know, how did enlargements generally, and especially the, the enlargement in 1995 and 2004 till seven EU enlargements change group dynamics, for example, regarding integrational integration of ideology, voting cohesion. Seventh, at the administrative level, how did the structure and role of the group secretariats evolve over time? Have the group dynamics changed? And if so, when and how? For example, is there a shift in influence in some groups from the secretary general to the group chair's personal staff? Eighth, how have relations with the leaders, leaders of the associated European party federations evolved over time? Was there or is there a clear distinction between concrete legislative action and ideological development and transnational coordination of national parties? Ninth, how has cooperation with the European Parliament presidents evolved? And did it matter whether the group chair shared the same party affiliation or nationality, for example? Tenth, how did the chairs work with their counterparts in other political groups, in the Conference of Presidents or more informally? How important were the growing European Parliament powers for the way group chairs thought to insert their group into formal or informal coalition in the European Parliament? Eleventh, how has cooperation with the Commission and the Council evolved from before to after the introduction of the trilogue? Overall, has the European Parliament's influence been strengthened due to the acquisition of more legislative powers, already weakened due to the intergovernmental crisis management? And lastly, with the growth of the European Parliament's legislative powers over time, the groups have increasingly developed into a core element of the European Parliament's and European Union's legislative machinery. But has this perhaps made communication with the wider public more challenging? That's a quite a long list of questions. <laughs> but could I, could I add one more? Okay, why do you think so few women historically has been a former group chairs? That's something they didn't have time to prepare, as you can see. For example, only one Pauline Green from the Socialists could have qualified for, for this event, and sadly she couldn't join us. Uh, and I think this is uh, really what we should bear in mind, that uh, I'm ha happy that we have uh, uh, more and more gender-based, uh, gender-equal uh, uh, parliament. We have the female president of the European Parliament, but still, I think when we look to the trajectory of uh, the leaders of, uh, of the political parties, uh, women are lacking behind. And it would be interesting for me to know what do you think about it, why it happened? I would like to thank you all of you. I'm really looking forward to, to, to this discussion and especially to the lessons learned from all our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President Chakansova, uh, for introducing the event uh, so competently and also asking this extra intriguing question, of course. Um, I would like to introduce now the uh, academic who's kindly joined us to take us through the formation of the transnational groups in 1953 and also uh, who's also going to explain a little bit the trajectory of the transnational groups, the surprising degree of stability, for example, of the transnational groups, um, at least in the center, center 
center left to center right of the European Parliament. Jürgen Mittag is professor at the Sports University of Cologne. Surprisingly, perhaps I will explain this in a minute. He studied political science, medieval and modern history and German literature at the universities of Cologne, Bonn and Oxford between 1992 and 1997. He received his PhD from the University of Cologne in 2000. From 1997 to 2003, he was research assistant at the Jean Monnet Chair for Political Science at the University of Cologne, working with Wolfgang Wessels, and from 2003 to 2010, managing director at the Institute for Social Movements at the Ruhr University in Bochum. Since 2011, he's chairholder and head of the Institute of European Sport Development and Leisure Studies at the German Sport University in Cologne, where he was also awarded a Jean Monnet Chair. Alongside the history of sports, Professor Mitter is mainly an expert of European political parties and party groups in historical and interdisciplinary perspective. And it's, of course, in this capacity that we've invited him to uh, do this introductory academic lecture today. Professor Mitter. Thank you. Dear Ms. Vice President, dear honorary members, dear Wolfgang Kaiser, dear guests, the political groups of the European Parliament stand for a unique case of transnational representation. As central working units of the European Parliament, the political groups do not only assemble the elected MEPs in groupings that pursue similar goals, but they also bundle the positions of the different national parties represented over here. If we compare the European Parliament with other parliamentary assemblies beyond the nation state, the European Parliament is characterized by the high degree of transnational institutionalization of political groups and from a more historical perspective, also with the comparatively early origins. While other transnational assemblies either do not know transnational political groups at all, or as in the case of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, they have a much weaker degree of political cooperation between parties. The European Parliament has been characterized by a high degree of transnational representation from the very beginning. These political groups of the European Parliament are almost as old as the Parliament itself, and that is also the major reason that we are gathered over here in view of 70 years of transnational representation in the European Parliament. Since 1953, the MEPs who were initially not directly elected but delegated to the European Coal and Steel Community Assembly from the national parliaments of the member states have formally come together in political groups. Against this backdrop of this very initial observations, I would like to discuss in my first part the general conditions, but also the very specific incentives that contributed to political groups comparatively early in the European Parliament, or better to say, in the Common Assembly of the European Coal and Steel Community. The second part of my talk will then deal with the question what kind of changes the political groups of the European Parliament have undergone in the past decades and how these changes can be explained. Special attention will be paid to the fact that around 175 national parties are represented in the European Parliament, but that the number of political groups has remained largely stable up to the present day. So what explains the comparatively high level of coherence and the stability in the European Parliament. For this second part, you will find a handout on your seats, revealing to some extent the very diverse and to some extent also difficult evolution of European Parliament political groups. So for the second part, you may have a closer look at this kind of handout. Let me start with the formation of political groups. The European Coal and Steel Community Treaty, which came into force in 1952, made no provision for potential political groups in the Common Assembly. Thus, there were also no stipulations as to whether the deputies should be grouped along national or political lines. On September 10, 1952, the Common Assembly met for the very first time. The initial 78 members were recruited 
according to Article 20 of the ECSC Treaty, and I quote it, from representatives of the peoples of the states brought together in the community. They were delegated to Strasbourg from the ranks of the individual national parliaments. This practice established, in principle, the dual or double mandate, which meant that until 1979, MEPs were, without exception, national parliamentarians who also held a mandate in the European Parliament and consequently also showed considerable differences in the mode of delegation. The most important difference concerned the length of the mandate, the distribution of mandates among the various chambers of the national legislatures, and also the modes of appointment. In contrast to the German, the Dutch, or the Belgian system of orientation in line of political strengths, the Strasbourg parliamentarians in other countries were elected by a majority of the respective chamber. In Italy, even by a majority, by an absolute majority. For a long time, the veto of the Social Democrats and the bourgeois parties in Italy and France prevented extreme right-wing or communist deputies from France or Italy in the European Parliament. While the first roots of procedure of the Common Assembly, which came into force on January 1953, initially only provided for committees, but not for groups or political groups, the corresponding article was added five months later. So the question arises, what has happened between January and May 1953? In a letter to Jean Monnet dated February 26, 1953, the chairman of the Committee on Budget and Administration, the German Martin Blanc, stated, I quote, that the majority of members considered that the formation of political groups at supranational level is an essential contribution to foster the work of the assembly and thus to consolidating the European community. Rather ambitious quote. The committee referred the matter to the Committee of Rules, which prepared a dossier on the different national modes of group formation in the ESC, ECSC member states. After more detailed debates, the committee agreed on the provisional wording, another quote, members of the assembly may form themselves into groups according to their different political tendencies. Remarkably, there was no explicit mentioning of political groups and even more far-reaching consideration, considerations such as, for instance, an article on the financing of political groups. It was to take almost another three months before a final wording on the legal status of political groups was found. At the meeting of the Committee of Rules on June the 8th, 1953, the topic, quote, organization of members in political group was put again on the agenda. Here it was stipulated that, and I quote now again, first, Deputies may form political groups on the basis of their political affiliation. Secondly, the political groups shall be formed after a declaration of formation has been forwarded to the President of the Assembly, which must contain the name of the group, the signature of its members, and the designation of its office. This declaration shall be made public. Third, no one may be on the list of members of more, of more than one political group. Fourthly, Lastly, the minimum number of members required to form a political group is set at nine, nine persons. At the meeting of the ECSC Assembly on June the 16th, 1953, so nearly 70 years ago today, this kind of regulation was adopted unanimously. This paved the way for the orientation of Parliament's internal structures along political lines. Officially, three political groups were given corresponding status. We heard it already, the Christian Democratic Group, the Socialist Group, and the Liberals and Allies Group. What has been said so far suggests that the formation of political groups in the ECSC with a view to negotiations and rules of committee should primarily be explained with technical adjustments and rules of procedure. However, a different picture emerges when one looks at the debates in the Assembly. Almost immediately at the constitution of the Joint Assembly, when the MEPs voted on the election of the presidency, 
a party political dispute had arisen. At the inaugural session on September the 10th, 1952, the election of the Speaker of the Parliament was on the agenda. Several prominent conservative candidates, Christian Democrat and conservative candidates from Germany and France had signaled their interest. But Heinrich von Entano from Germany, who was also the chairman of the Christian Democratic Party group in the German Bundestag, was considered to be the designated president. The reason, as the Christian Democratic and conservative deputies formed a majority in the assembly, as Jean Monnet, as a Frenchman, was already president of the high authority, and an Italian was president of the Court of Justice, the appointment of a German politician from the conservatives was considered as largely uncontroversial. However, when the election came up, the Belgian socialist Paul Henri Spark announced his candidature. This act by the socialist Spark was seen as a surprise because he has declared the, on the eve of the election that he was not really interested. The outcome of the election was even a larger surprise. Contrary to all except expectations of political observers, it was Spark and not Brentano who won the election. An absolutely majority of the votes cast was required in the first ballot. A total of 30 votes were cast for from Brentano, 38 votes were counted for Spark, who was thus elected. The result can be attributed to the fact that Spark succeeded in uniting the votes of all French, Belgium and Luxembourg parliamentarians in the assembly, and that he additionally mobilized the votes of the Dutch, the Italian and the German socialists and social democrats as well and two more liberals from Italy. This kind of uh, election result reflects the divergent loyalties of the deputies and parliamentarians on the one hand with their political and their national affiliation. While the primary Francophone MEPs from France, from Belgium and Luxembourg voted according to national considerations, the Dutch, the German and the Italian voted along their political considerations. Undoubtedly, nevertheless, Spark's high prestige also played an important role. The former Belgian Prime Minister enjoyed a high international reputation as a former president of the UN General Assembly and as the first president of the Assembly of the Council of Europe. Once the foundation of the political groups has been laid, it subsequently developed a certain momentum of its own. For example, the role of the political groups was upgraded by the fact that the group leaders became members of the presidential committee and in this way could influence the agenda. In the course of the debates on the budget, the Joint Assembly for the period 1953-1954 obtained financial resources, which were also allocated to the political group. The decisions taken in the course of the legal and financial arrangements for the formation of political groups subsequently correlated with the working processes of the Joint Assembly. Already in the 1950s, some kind of a transnational political culture gradually emerged, based above all on growing communication between representatives from different countries. Important feature of this kind of cooperation was the parliamentary infrastructure which led to an increasing professionalization. Professionalization also mirrored in the political group's work in addition to other kind of committee meetings. Mirrored also in the establishment of independent secretariats, the formation of working groups and also the use of own premises. However, the fact that the politicization of the ECSC assembly and the formation of transnational parliamentary culture has also some limitations is documented by the consideration about seating arrangements. In the consultative assembly, an alphabetical seating was originally arranged. This principle was intended to counteract a too, too strong orientation towards nationality or nations. After the formal formation of political groups in 1953, this kind of alphabetical seating order was initially retained. Just in the recourse of the reconstitution of the assembly after the Treaty of Rome came into force in 1958, 
the parliamentarians took their seats in accordance with their political group affiliation. At this point, I would like to draw already some brief interim conclusions. A whole bundle of causes can be identified for the early politicization of the ECSC by transnational groups. Of fundamental importance was undoubtedly the autonomy, autonomy in matters of routes of procedure. The fact that the Assembly had the right to decide on its own budget allowed the Assembly to establish a much more developed parliamentary political infrastructure within a rather short time as in other transnational parliamentary assemblies. This parliamentary configuration was reinforced by political conflicts in the course of the election of the president, but also by other political disputes, for instance, in view of the assembly's budget. The strong will of the parliamentarians to deal with their own draft budget almost inevitably led to a reflection about the self-image and the future role of the common assembly in view of institutional architecture. Regardless of all differences, a consensus emerged across parties and countries to further develop the ECSC Assembly in view of transnational parliamentary models and as a key element of this to further foster the rule of political groups. This brings me to my second part. How have political groups developed over the decades? And now you may take a look at the handout where you will find some evidence on the emerge of party groups. Until the 1960s, it was quite easy. There were only three. And until 1973, there were just four political groups. And only then some kind of differentiation took place. In essence, the first decades were dominated by the Christian democratic political group, a social democratic political group, and a political group of liberals and allies. The formation of political groups was thus strongly oriented towards classical cleavages and roughly corresponded with ideological patterns in the national parliaments of the ECSC member states. With the exception of two MEPs, all parliamentarians in 1952 had joined one of the three political groups. This balance of power despite varying, varying national election results, remained almost constant until the beginning of the 1960s. The Christian Democrats counted for 50%, the Social Democrats roughly for 30%, and the Liberals for 17 until 22%. The loosest grouping was the Liberal ones who neither has established working groups nor any kind of publication issued. After this, the changes came into effect when the French Gaullists left the Liberal group in 1963. After a few years of independence, they formed their own group in 1965 under the label of European Democratic Union, initially with a purely national orientation after another change in the rules of procedure. That was possible after these rules of procedure. The enlargement round in 1973 led to further differentiation. The Gullis group renamed itself the Group of European Democrats for Progress after Danish and Irish MEPs joined. At the same time, a new group was formed, the European Conservative Group, Conservative group in which British and Danish MEPs joined forces. In addition, in 1973, for the very first time, a communist group was formed in the European Parliament, Communist and Allies. These party groups' uh, formation were made possibly by another change in rules of procedure. Whereas since 1965, a quorum of 14 MP MEPs in total had been necessary to form a political group, it was decided in October 1973 that in future only 10 MEPs from three states would be needed. The balance of power of the two largest political groups initially remained unaffected. Majorities just changed when the British Labour Party which had initially not sent any deputies to Strasbourg in the wake of the British exception, abandoned its blockade. Following, at that time, the positive British referendum on EC membership, the party decided to also delegate MEPs to the Socialist Group in the European Parliament on July 75. The Socialists thus formed 
in 75, the largest group in the European Parliament and remained so until the 1999 EP elections. And now a lot of changes happened, particularly in view of the direct elections in 1979. Only 68 of the 1980 members from the old parliament had returned to the new European Parliament, which was more than twice as large and now counted 410 parliamentarians. Despite increased transnational party activity in the run-up of the elections, it took time to complete the formation of political groups among the directly representatives of roughly 60 national parties. Many names changed, but the former political groups remained largely stable. They showed a high level of continuity after the 79 elections. In addition to the existing or renamed groups, only a group for the technical coordination of independence was established. After 1984, this group turned out to be the Rain Group group, and in 1984 as well, a new group of the European right was added, which lasted at least for two electoral periods. The decade between 1989 and 1999 saw the most significant changes to date in the European Parliament internal political structure. Communist groups split into a short-lived moderate group led by the Italian post-communists and into a class struggle group dominated by the French Communist Party. The erosion of the Italian party system has elementary consequences. After the 1994 elections, there was a considerable movement in the Christian democratic and conservative spectrum. Forza Italia, founded by Silvio Berlusconi, had initially formed you may remember its own nationally homogeneous political group under the title Forza Europa. It merged later on with the European Democratic Alliance, but was still dominated by the French Gaullists to form a new political group in July 1995 under the new Graham Union for Europe. Ah, yes, sorry. Thank you, yes. In the meantime, the Greens, essentially under the leadership of German Greens, formed a known political group, as they had already done in 1988. The regionally oriented MEPs joined the European Radical Alliance for the 1994 uh, for the parliamentary terms. After the direct election, there was a trend towards differentiation of the political groups, but, however, the overall composition were rather stable. The number of political groups even declined. In the 1994 to 1999 political term, nine groups were established. Afterwards, in 1999, it were eight. In 2004, only seven political groups were formed. In, 90, in 2009, after the dissolution of the UN political group, there were again seven political groups, as in 2014, as in 2019. The formation of political groups on the right-wing fringe remained mostly episodic, even if the current ID political group shows a certain degree of stability. In view of the time, I would like already at this point to come to some kind of con conclusions. You will see the follow-up, how things have emerged, particularly of uh, interest in the Christian Democrat and conservative spectrum where, especially under guidance of Helmut Kohl, the German CEO managed to put many things on the, uh, under the umbrella, but also the limitations of this kind of policy by the separation of the conservatives after the 2009 election. A closer look at the process of forming political groups in the European Parliament documents a permanent tension between change and continuity. The composition and size of the political groups in the European Parliament is undoubtedly subject to changes, just like the political groups in the national parliaments, which can be attributed to different election results, political reorientations, and strategic behavior. If we disregard the spectrum of right-wing and extreme right-wing political group, which is characterized by a permanent change, as well as the most latent tension between Christian Democrat and conservatives, an increasing stability has crystallized since the end of the mid-1990s. 
particularly the instrument of political group rings, bringing together different European political parties in one political party group in the European Parliament, seems to be an appropriate instrument together and to collect political forces. Overall, the formation of political groups in the European Parliament is strongly influenced by its procedural rules, namely by the rules of procedure in its particular dimension. Even if they have just a technical function, their article clearly reflects the political will to promote the formation of supranational groups and at the same time to prevent small national units. The rule of procedure of the parliament provides the political group with considerable privileges, which clearly increase the interest in forming such a political group. At the same time, the financial support from the parliament's spot is also considerable. Ultimately, it's not only the change in competencies of the European Parliament that is reflected in the development of the political groups, but also the increasing coherence of the group. After the direct elections in 1979, the European Parliament was still a talking parliament, which could grant its parliamentarians a high degree of freedom and independence. With the increase in competence in the area of legislative rights, especially in the area of the first pillar of community policies, the EP has, on the other hand, increasingly developed into the direction of a working parliament with a highly differentiated structure and more professional political groups. This tendency to strengthen and to normalize the parliamentary dimension of the EP would not be conceivable without the political groups which nevertheless mark a unique case of democracy in a transnational democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mittag, for this very insightful overview of the history of transnational groups. An impossible task that we set you to talk about the history of the transnational groups across a period of 70 years, which you've uh, tackled admirably, I think. I will now introduce the panelists to you, and I will do this in the order of the current size of the group. So I will start as a result with hans Gerd Pöttering, who is a German politician from the Christian Democratic Union from the Emsland region. He was an MEP from 1979 to 2014 for this incredible period of 35 years and held a number of leading positions both in the European Parliament and in the European People's Party throughout his political career. From 1999 to 2007 he was chairman of the EPP group in the European Parliament and today that is precisely the reason for why we've invited you to attend this meeting and to contribute to it. From 2007 to 2009, as Etienne Basso has already mentioned, he served as its president. He also initiated the House of European History, which opened in Brussels in 2017. Moreover, from 2018 to 22, he was president of the European Parliament Former Members Association. He's published widely on European affairs, including his autobiography titled Wir sind zu unserem Glück vereint, Mein Europäischer Weg, and I found it over there in the library, and I must say it looks as if it's been massively used and read already, uh, even in the German version, because I think there's also an English version of your autobiography as well. Until 2018, moreover, he chaired the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and he's now its representative for European affairs. Now, to my left, we have Hannes Woboda. Hannes Woboda was born in at Deutsch Altenburg in 1946. After studying law and economics at the University of Vienna, he worked at the Vienna Chamber of Labour between 1972 and 86. From 1983 to 1988, he was a member of the Vienna Federal State Parliament for the Austrian Social Democratic Party. He also served as city councillor for Vienna for many years. He was appointed to the European Parliament after Austria joined the European Union and led the SPÖ list as the lead candidate in 2004 and 2009. In the EP, Hannes Svoboda served on 15 committees, 11 delegations, and as rapporteur on many, rapporteur on many reports. He was also vice president of the Socialists and Democrats from 1996 to 2012, and its chair from 2012 until 2014. And last but not least, we've got uh, Kais de Vries, 
who is a senior visiting fellow at the European Institute of the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has served as state secretary in the Dutch government and was its representative in the European Convention in the early 2000s. He has been a senior advisor to EU High Commissioner, uh, High Representative, I'm sorry, uh, Javier Solana, and the first European Union counterterrorism coordinator. As a member of the Dutch VVD, Reis de Vries was chairman of the group of the European Liberal Democrat and Reform Party in the European Parliament from 1994 to 98. In 2010, he switched his political allegiance from the uh, center-right VVD to the center-left liberal D66. He is a former chairman of the European Security Research and Innovation Forum and a co-founder of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And in fact, it's now in the historical sequence that I would li like to ask Reis de Vries to start off because you were chairman in the 1990s and then we will proceed with Ansgeet Pöttering and Hannes Wobeda in this sequence. But before you start, I would just like to encourage those who are with us online to ask any questions that you have at any time in the chat function and we will then um, proceed later on in the questions answer sessions to use some of these questions. If I could just remind you of the eight maximum 10 minutes for the initial round, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much um, organizers for uh, inviting me to share the panel with two such distinguished colleagues. And indeed uh, with my old friend, Graham Watson, uh, other former leader of the Liberal Democrats in the European Parliament, uh, who, uh, went on to chair also the European Liberal Party Federation. So uh, anything that I have to say is under his watchful eye. Um, I, I would already invite him to add his perspective later because I think you'll find it fascinating. Um, you asked us all to address a few of your uh, many questions, which, which I'll try to do. I'll focus on the initial set uh, and uh, smuggle in one or two uh, questions uh, of my own. But to very briefly pick up the point on women, when I joined the European Parliament, uh, I joined a group chaired by Simone Weil former president of the European Parliament and, of course, one of France's historic uh, uh, women politicians who's played such an incredibly courageous role in liberalizing the abortion legislation uh, in France. She was an excellent member of the European Parliament and of the group. Uh, and let me just say hello to Elmar Brock, uh, who is coming in here, with whom I've had many happy memories, uh, both in, in the European Parliament and in the United States. Close bracket. Um, Simone Feil, but I've also worked very well with Claudia Roth uh, as leader of the Green Group and with Catherine Lalumiere as leader of uh, one of the radical groups in the European Parliament. So I think women have always played a very significant role, as they should. I was elected in 1994 after having been a member of the European Parliament for 10 years and having led twice my party in the European elections. Uh, and um, at the time I was leader of the largest national contingent in the European Liberal uh, Group. Your question about cohesion is interesting. Uh, as the uh, uh, introduction has already indicated, ideological cohesion in the Liberal Group has always been um, fairly light, at least in the beginning. But the Liberals and Allies, as the group was called before it became Eel the Other. There were classic Liberals, Liberal Democrats, um, uh, the Liberal Italian uh, Party, uh, the Bel Flemish Liberals, but there were also parties like the Italian Republicans. Uh, or if you go to uh, Denmark, there was Venstre and Ranike Le Venstre. Uh, if you go to Finland, there was the Swedish uh, People's Party, and the center party. In a sense, there's always been two tendencies, one slightly more left, uh, left liberal and one slightly more right liberal. But there was enough to keep those people together. And I think in the end, ideological diversions have never hobbled the ELDR. There was always a sense of live and let live on the basis of mutual trust and common principles. And as long as these were respected, the group found its way. And indeed, rather successfully in a number of instances, particularly when the EPP and the PES disagreed in the European Parliament. When the two big groups disagreed, the Liberals could often sway the balance. We usually voted with the Christian Democrats on social economic issues, but on human rights, we found much more in common with the Greens and with the Social Democrats. In terms of divergence and, and um, uh, yeah. uh, diversity, 
The difficult part was the sort of the national traditions that played a role. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, at the invitation of Giorgio Lamalfa, who was then the head of the Italian Republican Party, the Lega Nord at some point joined the European Liberal Group. The Lega Nord at the time was a group of small and medium prized enterprise defenders in northern Italy who was in favor of regional development and everybody was happy with them. Until uh, their leader, Umberto Bossi, uh, discovered the electoral attractiveness of being uh, anti foreigner. That was completely unacceptable to the group. And he therefore placed himself outside the consensus of mutual trust and common principles. And in the end, the group basically made him leave. So he was removed from the liberal family. The other instance where national differences played a role in the liberal group was had to do with Portugal. The Portuguese PSD, um, which called itself a social democratic party, joined the liberal family, um, but then found out that the EPP was headed by um, Helmut Kohl. And that made much better television uh, back in um, uh, Portugal. So at some stage, the, P the, the uh, Social Democrats from Portugal decided to switch allegiance. They left the Liberal family and joined the EPP for domestic political reasons. Having said that, I look back with um, a great deal of satisfaction on the period we had in the European Parliament, where a lot was achieved, and usually across national borders, and indeed across parties. There are two lessons learned that I would like to share with you if I look back on the past 25 years. One is that we should never underestimate the enormous success that the European Union has become. In terms of its composition from the 12 member states when I was an MEP to 27 now and soon more than 30, a success in terms of its policy scope where it evolved from coal and steel and agriculture to a community that now talks about health policy, about defense and a single currency, the classic domains of national sovereignty in the past, but also in terms of the role of the European Parliament itself that evolved from the talking shop that the opening speech already indicated to what it is now, one of the world's most powerful legislatures. A huge development. A lot remains to be done. EMU is unfinished. The defense policy, our climate policy, much must be done. But the European Union is an island of civility in a turbulent world. And it's been the supreme honor of my life to have contributed a little bit to that development. But I think there's also a sense in which I have failed. And I have failed, I think, to recognize the strength of history and the difficulty Europeans have in overcoming certain of the historic patterns that have so, have so often hobbled Europe. I am deeply concerned at the right the, the rise of the violent extreme right in Europe today and the banalization of discrimination and nationalism and prejudice that we see across the Union. History has not been overcome. Um, European history has not been overcome. Um, Obama, I think, once said, the past is not dead, it is not even past. The European Union has been successful as a community of interests and elites, but not as a community of peoples and values. The leaders of Europe have focused more on the hardware of European integration than on the software of European integration. And I think that is where the greatest challenge today lies. And I'd like to close with three examples where I think the European Union must now put a much higher emphasis on values and on citizenship. One is the rule of law essential to the liberal tradition and to, I think, the ideals that we all share on this platform. The rule of law is in deep crisis today in Europe. If you look at Poland, if you look at Hungary, but if you also look at the attack by the German Bundesverfassungsgericht on the authority of the European Court of Justice, these are highly dangerous and problematic developments. Hungary and Poland today are no longer liberal democracies. It is essential that this drift is stopped. And one way of doing that is to lift the unanimity requirement on the possibility of the Council 
to freeze the voting rights of well, certain well, countries uh, when they diverge from the European common principles. The second key challenge is democracy. Democracy remains Europe's stepchild. European leaders have Europeanized, have pulled sovereignty, but they've not pulled democratic accountability sufficiently to compensate for the growing power of the European Union. That, I think, is a very dangerous development. There are two things we need. One, to move to a situation where the European Parliament also has the final say on the budget, including revenue, just as national parliaments have. And secondly, a common electoral system that will finally allow European political parties to take shape. It is high time to break the national stranglehold on European elections, which has played such an important role until now. And last but not least, there is citizenship. The citizens of Europe must feel at some point that they're not only national citizens, but they're also citizens of this common European adventure. And that means European citizenship education as a priority of countries and of the European Union. Something that the European Parliament in my time did not think about, and I think we were wrong. Citizenship education is in crisis. If you look at the national citizenship education, it focuses on learning facts about democracy, but not teaching children how to become Democrats, attitudes and skills. And the European dimension is completely missing, including in my own country. Who speaks about the European side of democracy in Dutch schools? Nobody. And that, I think, is a critical problem for Europe. I believe that the next stage of European integration will require that we address these three differences, these three problems. Because what Europe stands for now is the next big quantum leap in integration. And I'll close on that point. It will be at the same time enlargement with Ukraine and countries in the Balkans that will again change the nature of the EU. And at the same time, the European Union will have to be strengthened in terms of its powers and capacity to decide. But the more, the po more powerful the EU becomes, the more urgent it becomes to strengthen its democratic basis. So where I think we have not succeeded as European leaders in the past, I hope that today's generation will pick up the baton and fight for these values. Democracy, the rule of law and citizenship as priorities for the Union in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Heis de Vries, for these very interesting observations and, and appeals to contemporary leaders who have influence over EU politics and policy making. We move on to Hans Gerd Pöttering, who can perhaps also add some actual memories from his time as um, the leader of the EPP group in this period before you became president of the European Parliament. In fact, you're one of the few former presidents of the European Parliament because that's probably the most important reason for this, uh, to whom an entire biography, not just your own autobiography, but biography has been devoted. Uh, and alone some 100 pages or so are devoted to this period when you were chair of the EPP group. And I would just like to quote from this, quote you, from an interview that uh, Michael Gila conducted with you, where you say it requires leading a transnational political group in the European Parliament in incredible degree of empathy with the other's position and a high level of willingness to compromise. So I assume these are two qualities that you see in yourself and that you try to apply as group chair to the work of the EPP group. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kaiser, and thank you, uh, Professor Mittag, for your contribution, and of course, uh, Reis de Vries. You are very generous uh, with us to give us 10 minutes. I tried to be shorter. When we were chairman, in this case, really chairman or presidents, chairwomen of our groups, we had uh, six, seven minutes. So you give us 10, you're quite uh, generous. Uh, I tried to give some answers to those 11 uh, or more uh, questions. I was elected, as Elmar Brook uh, remembers, uh, the 13th of July in 1999. And for the very first time, the EPP became the biggest group. And uh, to become chairman of a group, uh, the circumstances uh, must be positive that you become the chairman of the group. And Wilfried Martens, who was chairman of our group and of the party, of course, EPP party, uh, he left uh, the uh, European Parliament, to my astonishment, in 1999, and so the position was free. 
and I was ambitious and uh, I tried to do my work when I was his um, deputy from 94 to 99. I was responsible for uh, for the um, uh, Treaty of uh, Amsterdam, the, the, the challenges for the European Parliament, our powers and so on. And then in the last two and a half years until 99, and I cooperated excellently with Johannes Svoboda, I was responsible for enlargement. And so it was a natural process uh, when uh, Wilfried Martens was not present anymore. And Paul Rubich, I don't know when you, remembered, when you joined uh, the European Parliament. 96, so you, you were there, and Simon Busotil, was, uh, who is Secretary General now of the EPP group, was uh, there as well. And so it was a natural, nat uh, natural process that I became uh, the chairman. And I will describe the situation in July 99, and then you get an answer to the challenges. Romano Prodi was the candidate of the governments to become uh, president of the European Commission. And although I now have an excellent relation, uh, he is a great person, I was not happy with this situation because he did not belong to the EPP group, or EPPED, ED for the British Conservatives mainly. And, uh, but I was not strong enough in July 99 to prevent his, uh, his election. And so we agreed five points with him before he was elected, and I will mention only three that the members of the Commission have to give priority to their calendar the presence in the European Parliament. And in the past, the Commissioners, I would not say, didn't care, but the European Parliament was not important, and he agreed. Secondly, that we demanded from him to dismiss a member of the Commission if she or he, the member of the Commission, behaved in a wrong way, corruption or things like that, and there was a case, uh, you all know, with a commissioner from uh, France and um, Santerre, his predecessor could not dismiss the person because a commissioner from France cannot leave the, the commission. And he, clever as he was, before the confidential vote, ask all future members of the commission, will you step down when I ask you to do it? And the third point is, there's always a great discussion about the right of initiative of the European Parliament. In my opinion, this is not a very important point, we asked Prodi if the European Parliament wants an initiative from your side, from the Commission, will you follow this on, or will you not do it? And he agreed. There was a little margin uh, legally that he could not say, I will always do it, but he said, normally I will do it, something like that. So we increased our power. Then there was the Nice uh, summit in December 2000, and the result was not very good. The figures concerning the new members, members of parliament, a voting system in the council, that was agreed, but the meeting uh, was during the night and you could see that this procedure didn't uh, work anymore. And Elmar Brook was our uh, member of observers in, in many, many uh, intergovernmental conferences. And so we said, we want a new system for the reform of the European uh, Union. And finally, we got uh, the convention under the leadership of Giscard d'Estaing, who, by the way, started in the Liberal Group and then joined the EPP. What was a good development for us, <laughs> guys. So we got, we got the, uh, the convention. And then the great failure uh, of the uh, constitutional treaty in France and uh, in the Netherlands. And your foreign minister, who is not only a good European Ben Bot, but a good Christian Democrat, if I can say this, uh, he said the treaty is uh, dead. And then I criticized him for the statement. He came to my office and uh, with three people. And I said, Minister, how can you say the treaty is dead? We have to find a new solution to, to keep the substance. And then there was it, it was a good combination of people. I will not include myself now because I want to be uh, modest, uh, but of course the European Parliament made a contribution. And Nicolas Sarkozy, in his election campaign in 2007, said there will be a new treaty, a slimmer one, and I said, Nicolas, this will not be possible. But he said our National Assembly 
and uh, the Senate will will agree to it, and uh, we will not have a referendum. And then there was Angela Merkel and others and others, and I will not go into all the details. And so we got finally the Treaty of Lisbon. And finally, because I see the time is already running, I always, as a German, had the principle that the group did not feel too much that I was leading the group. I always knew what I wanted, but they should not feel it. And for me, the so-called small delegations were just as important as the big ones. And I said always to myself, it's dangerous if you have the big delegations against you, the Germans, the British, the French, and so on, but you need to have the small delegations for you. And this was, I think, the, the atmosphere in, in our political group, and that's why, why I could uh, have the chairmanship for seven and a half years. And my last word is, and I agree totally what Reis de Vries has said, for the future of the European Union, it's in, of greatest importance that the European law is above uh, the national law, because if we go back to the national law, you will destroy the European Union. And if we are not strong in ourselves, we cannot make a contribution outside. But if we are strong, when we are strong inside, then I think we can make our contribution. And the greatest challenge is now helping the people uh, of Ukraine. And my last uh, phrase is, and that's why I'm altogether optimistic, despite of the right-wing uh, development in some countries of the European Union, the European Union is not the paradise on Earth but it's the better part of, uh, of, our, uh, of our world. And so it's worthwhile to continue this work here in the European Parliament and in the European institutions. Thank you very much, hans Gerd Pöttering. And in fact, you have already created a fantastic transition, I think, to Hannes Swoboda, because Hannes Swoboda is, of course, from a smaller delegation, a smaller member state, Austria, which moreover joined the European Union later. So not a founding member state like the Netherlands or Germany, but a country that joined in 1995 in the so-called sometimes Northern enlargement, although it's a Central European country. So I'm wondering whether in addition to anything else that you were planning to say, whether you could comment a little bit on whether it made a difference for you to come from a smaller delegation and the country that had joined only 15 years or so before you became chair of your group. Yes, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I try to be brief because I also have to leave more or less in time. Um, in a way, it was a surprise uh, because normally our group had uh, leaders from a big country. Uh, Pauline Green, for example, was uh, speaking about ladies, and now we have somebody from Spain. So, uh, and Germany, of course, was, and I was in Spain again. Uh, it was a bit surprising. Maybe it is in connection to see with the, the enlargement, because I was very much engaged in the enlargement process. I very much engaged in integrating uh, the people coming from the enlarged um, countries from Eastern Europe, more or less Eastern Europe, and so on, into the uh, political group. So they supported me when there was uh, the election. Uh, and it was more or less, I think, the first time that we had three candidates. We had a very prominent lady, former mayor from Strasbourg and the minister, uh, Katrin Trautmann. We had a very strongly engaged uh, uh, colleague uh, from Britain uh, who were running, and myself. Uh, I became uh, president uh, by absolute majority in the first round, so it was a bit surprise for many people that it was possible. But it was because of my management, of course, in the years before. I was for many years chair of the coordinators, and the coordinators play an important role in the political group. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, uh, people knew me and knew my, seems to be, skill in bringing in together and, and compromise. What is important, I think, for political leaders, as was mentioned already, is to balance the strengths of a group in forming a cohesion, giving some leadership, some ideology. Also, this expression today is not very much used on the one hand, but on the other hand, 
to cooperate with the others. Of course, for example, Mr. Pertwing, uh, Mr. Watson and others, because it is important to have that. When our group did not uh, cooperate and thought we can win, we had a very prominent former president from Portugal all of a sudden being our member and some of our people, especially from the southern countries, said, this is the best president for the parliament, we will go for him. We failed, of course. It was clear to me because the other, it was the time when the EPP and the Liberals worked together. If you don't think about compromising and finding an alliance, you will fail. Yeah, we, we, again and again. Uh, of course, you have to be very skillful. We had, it was not yet when I was president, uh, or even uh, before, that uh, we rejected two commissioners during the hearings. Uh, it was not very much seen because they were more from the EPP side, but we had an alliance with the Liberals and the Greens on that. And then there was also one case when the Socialist Commissioner was, uh, candidate was not very, uh, very uh, efficient, uh, but I must say Mr. Ruivik helped very much to find a solution to, to shift him to another position where then he got a smaller, more and less important. Uh, position and never forget the, the help and support of Mayor Strankolik on this. Maybe it was not well seen in the EPP that he helped to find a solution for the socialists, but this is all the European Parliament. That, uh, of course, you, f you are not finding always the way, you know, to, to put through your ideas and to go for confrontation. Sometimes, of course, it's necessary. People outside have to see. Sometimes we even criticize. Are you always making compromise? Uh, but th that's, that's a part of politics to make compromise, especially on the European level. The difficulty, of course, is that some members who at home are never in coalition, or at least it was in the past, always was either you or me, either your party or our party, they didn't understand that in this parliament you have to go for a compromise. They always wanted a confrontation. And... Um, also, the leadership, of course, has to try to, to, to convince members. We had one very prominent member from France. She was a, a, a committee chair and she was coordinator. She was always, you know, with her head. She, she wanted to say, I am going for it and you have to support me. She only came to the leader when she saw that she will fail unless the leader will support or will speak with the other political leaders. So this is also the question of the management to say, okay, you can go. Go for it, run for it. You will see uh, until you have this on the wall and then you will come uh, in order to find some sort of a, of a compromise. So I think that that's very important that you, that the management as also um, Hans Gert said, it's not that as a leader you can say we go for that direction because one of the question is how do you come to, to, to majority and what to do about the rebels? I think very often you have to have members to discuss. And sometimes, when I was deputy leader, my former leader, uh, Mr. Schultz left the meeting when it was too difficult, uh, and that, okay, you do it. And let people discuss, because the difference was, uh, it's not, not because he, had a, he was not uh, willing to, he had so strong opinion already in the, in the beginning that he was annoyed when other people spoke, or members spoke against this opinion. And I could say, okay, you have a different opinion. At the end of the day, of course, you have to say, now we have to vote. And I tell you very much what I expect of the result. And then you have come to a solution. The last point I want to take up, but uh, Mr. De Vries said, look, democracy. I, we, we cannot prevent everything. Well, you, you are very much on your, on your line on, on this very undemocratic development we have in some countries. And I must say, some of the leaders uh, whom I very honor very much have to be soft, too soft on Mr. Orban for many time, years, and also on, on, on Mr. Kaczynski, but more on Orban. Uh, but this is another issue. It's not easy if you have such people in your own political group, I uh, have to recognize. But I always said to my members, Europe is not Brussels alone. Brussels is important. But if our members are not able or have not enough time or not enough engagement or not enough support at home to fight for that Europe at home, not only here speaking in Brussels, I think this 
connection between our activities here in Brussels or in Strasbourg and our engagement at home, and I must say it also for me, is not working well. Why? Because we are so much engaged, of course, in our political debates and work and our external activities and so on, that maybe is not enough time at home to, to fight for that Europe. And if we don't fight for Europe, if we take it for granted, we will fail. So I think uh, my, my appeal again is to, to all the members uh, and you members now, please fight for that Europe. It is not, you cannot take it for granted that it will exist. Think about Ukraine is coming. Think about Serbia, other countries are joining the European Union. How can we manage it if we don't reform the European Union, of course, and if we don't fight for it? So the fight for Europe and not take it for granted is for me the most important thing all the members of the European Union, the European Parliament have to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannes Svoboda, for these fascinating insights. So I, I guess uh, being used to the Viennese coffee house culture, if that's a correct interpretation, helped you to manage uh, your group during the period when you were chair of it uh, in the early 2010s. Now, <laughs> uh, we now have time for, for uh, questions and I would really like to ask you to keep your questions or observations that you have from your own experience, of course, as short as possible so that the uh, panelists also have time to respond to that. So we'll take three, I would suggest, from the floor and then see whether there are any others in the next round from the online participants. Graham Watson. Thank you very much. Uh, the member state that I had the honor to represent here for 20 years is sadly no longer here, but I am delighted to have had the honor of serving together with all three of your distinguished panelists uh, and congratulate EPRS on organizing this very, very useful meeting today. Can I um, suggest that there are two points that should not be overlooked in the study of the transnational groups? The first is the situation between 1979 and 1999, when the United Kingdom's electoral system completely distorted the size of the groups. If the Labour Party was strong and the first-past-the-post system gave them a big representation, the socialist group was bigger than it should have been, and vice versa if the Conservatives. The Liberals always suffered. And I think it's important that we recognize that the problems with the United Kingdom did not start in 2016. Actually, they were there a lot earlier. The second point I'd like to make, and I have not had the honor to read Hans Gert's book yet, but Wilfred Martins, in his book, I Struggle, I Overcome, writes very extensively, as I do a little in my book, um, Building a Liberal Europe, about the role of the German political foundations in the building of the transnational political families. And in all of my experience, that was crucial for the liberal family. I'm sure it has been for the others. It may be that the European political foundations, which Hans Gert was active in establishing in the, uh, re the, the regulations of 2003 and 2007, will eventually take over this role. But we should not overlook the role that the German political foundations played. Thank you very much. Of course, the Liberal group had the strange abnormality to cater for this particular situation of the Liberals or the Liberal Democrats after the merger with the Social, uh, Social Democratic Party, which was that Russell Johnson was co-opted and took part, was actually encouraged and allowed to take part in meetings of the group, although he was not an MEP, in order to keep this connection with the British Liberal Democrats, which I think is an interesting uh, footnote, if you like, in the history of the European Parliament. If you could just quickly introduce yourself here in the front and uh, ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Domenic. I'm an MEP uh, from the Sandy, elected in Spain. I also want to join the previous colleague uh, to congratulate because it has been uh, fascinating to hear uh, Hans Gerd, Hannes and Angi. Um, and um, just to make it very short, um, I very much agree with everything that has been said. 
uh, and Guy, you said uh, we need this uh, di uh, European dimension of education, uh, of citizenship education, and you said that at the time this was not uh, uh, part of the debates of the European Parliament. Well, mm, this is uh, a coincidence because not that I'm saying it for advertisement, but I have been the rapporteur precisely on that topic uh, recently in the Parliament, so I'll be happy to send it to you. I think you will, you will like it. But you also talk about the need for a more common electoral system uh, in the European Union. And um, alongside Guy Verhofstadt, we have worked also on the proposal for a transnational uh, constituency, which for the first time uh, passed the plenary here in the Parliament after 20 years. So I wonder, this is maybe a, a question for all three, the, the logical culmination of, I've been hearing transnational all the time, transnational groups, is it the transnational constituency, the, the logical culmination of the transnational political groupings in the Parliament? Thank you very much. If you can pass on the microphone, please. Yes, thank you so much. My name is uh, Paul Rubik. Uh, I came, as Hans Gert uh, said, with 1995 at the end uh, to the European Parliament. And uh, behind you there is a sign of EPRS, European Parliament's Research Service. And I must say, I'm really proud that this was established uh, to give for the members a very good background of the different issues, because if you see how many legal acts, and I've heard up till uh, to the next elections, there are still 200 legal acts uh, to be done within the House, it's really necessary for the members of European Parliament and the assistants and the staff in the House to go into the depths and to have the chance uh, to get all the knowledge about it. What I'm missing, in, 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 especially in the Commission, is the options assessment. You know, in European Parliament, we had STOA, the Scientific Technology Options Assessment, with a lot of studies. And uh, if you see now the targets which we set for 2030, 2050, uh, the targets are voted pretty quick, but how to do it and how to install it, that's the real story. And I think next to the op options assessment, we would need much more uh, the so-called uh, impact assessment, which impact will it have? And uh, the last thing is the risk assessment. And if we look to the lifetime circle uh, of products and services, uh, it would have a big impact into our decision making. So the Im impact assessment of the European Parliament really should be uh, getting more influence uh, in the uh, setting of the targets, because otherwise we will be blamed that we can't fulfill them. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, if I may suggest, if you could pick any of these points selectively, any four of you would like to say something. If I may start, because I have to leave. Uh, I want to take, well, the, the socialist group was never too big, so uh, Graham, that's, uh, that, was not, that was not our problem. But I can, uh, some consolation may be that we had very good members from the Labour Party, but it was not easy always, because they had, especially on the budget, I, I would not envy anybody who's had to talk with them about the budget. But I want to take up uh, the, the question on, on the uh, all European um, uh, constituency and, and members when there was this this report i am critical not because i'm not stronger for european but in austria mr rubik and myself uh, we were or are uh, members for all austria formally at least of course he's more in upper austria more in vienna based already it's difficult to have austrian the general austrian interest but the important thing is to have local or regional interest in combination with Europe to convince my citizen well, from wherever you are in Austria, you have to be a pro-European if you want to present Austrian interest. European interests are not different from Austrian interests. If you look to the war, if you look to climate change, if you look to any other issue, you, you have it or whatever research, for example. Now there's the, the Austrian government says, uh, we have to restructure the budget, we cannot ha have more money. But they never say from where. We as MEPs have to say, yes, we have, we need more budget, not because we want to be the big uh, spenders, 
but already on, on research and development is not enough what we spend in order to be competitive. And even if an Austrian interest it is. So for me, of course, I would uh, live also with a different election structure. But for me, the important, most important thing is to combine local, regional and national interest with the European interest. There is no difference in it. And we have to convince our citizens not to see a difference. They up there in Brussels. No, it's us in Brussels and us in Austria or Germany or the Netherlands or wherever. Thank you. Well, well. Yeah, may, may, if you allow me, Reis, um, a positive point for Johannes Swoboda and then a critical one. I start with a positive one. I totally agree what you have said. And in the German language, uh, I always say Heimat, Vaterland, Europa. Heimat is quite emotional, means where you are at home, where you have your families, your friends, and so where your grassroots is. Then you are in a nation, you are living in a nation, and at the same time, we are uh, Europeans. But if you only think in the dimension of your Heimat, of your home, you will not defend it. If you think only of your country, then you become a nationalist, and nationalism uh, leads to war. And if you only feel as a European, then you have no roots. So I think we, we agree, and that's why I was for a long time chairman of my party in the region of Osnabrück, and my constituency, so to say, was Osnabrück-Emsland. And I think this gave me the basis to be near uh, to the people. Secondly, what Johannes said, and I want to be a little bit humorous, I hope I succeed, the socialists could never be big enough. I really was annoyed, Johannes, that and when you had your, your chairwoman, Pauline Green, a lady, and she counted for three. So, so she counted for three. And if you take the names of these buildings, Paul-Henri Spark, I have a great admiration for him. And then Altiero Spinelli, I have a great admiration for him. But why not one socialist and Konrad Adenauer, for instance? And I wanted to stop this. And that's why I finally broadened, we broadened our group. That was not the only reason. And uh, so brought uh, the others together. And my, what Dominic uh, has said, I am in favor of a European uh, uh, election system. But I would be reluctant to have too many European constituencies. I know to find a compromise, you must be a little bit open to it. But generally, the people are elected in their regions. And I think we should not uh, go too far with that. And my last point is, uh, thank you, Graham. We sat beside each other when Pat Cox had been elected uh, as president of the European Parliament. And it was a good time. And with you. Paul, of course, uh, as well, and I agree to this uh, impact assessment. Pardon? Okay, there are cert <laughs> certainly other, other things where we can criticize you or thank you, but this is vice versa. <laughs> okay. Well, just, just a, a footnote on, on the common electoral system. There are many different roads that lead to Rome. So there is not, I think, one ideal solution in terms of Europeanizing the common European electoral system. But the current situation, I think, is outdated. Uh, for the reasons that Graham mentioned, the, the sways in the British electorate have a disproportionate effect on the European Parliament, but also for the general reason that the European Parliament elections are held hostage by national political structures and national politicians that do not want to see the rise of a competing center of democratic power. And I think this is the underlying uh, reason why so many national leaders are not interested in changing the European electoral system. Again, there are different roads, uh, and we can talk about the technicalities, but I think it is an issue worth pushing. It's time to emancipate the European parliamentary elections from the national stranglehold retaining a link with national political reality, because democracy in Europe is always dual. It's rooted in national history, in a national uh, ways of thinking, but at the same time, we need a common European approach. The two have to go together, just that at some point, our regions came together and formed nations. Uh, if that's possible, the next stage, I think, is also possible. Thank you. We started a little bit late, so we'll just have to end a little bit late so that we have a chance perhaps for two or three questions from the chat on the online chat to be asked as well. Gilles Pitoz? Yeah. 
Um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have one, I think, a very important question uh, that really connects. Um, does it work? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have one important question that connects to the um, debate that we just had uh, from Daniel Danahato. I hope I pronounced it correctly. He asks, how can European citizens be better involved in European democracy? And what can European political parties do in this respect? That's it for the online. Is there another question from the floor here? No, then otherwise I would invite you to ask this very important question, which also perhaps points to the elections for the European Parliament next year already, the next elections. What's the role of citizens? How can they be involved more if they want to be involved? And how can perhaps European integration become more meaningful for citizens? Would like to start. Okay, so, okay, if I, if I may. I think this is a, somebody, maybe that Graham Watson said it already, uh, and, and you on the side uh, to my left as well. Uh, I think the national politicians on the regional level, on the local level, on the national level, they always have to understand that European politics uh, is part of our local, regional and national politics. And so if, if we, when we meet our electorate, the people, I think we always have to make this clear, and I am advocating strongly that uh, history must be part of the education in our schools, because with the new media, I'm not so familiar with the social media, but anyhow I can, can see the polit political impact. If you only see details and you don't have the full picture, then it might happen that uh, the young people don't understand our history and then bad things might, might come back and we see it in Russia. They have not really reconciled uh, their history with Stalin and with the totalitarian communism. What we, I think, in the Germany managed, not 100%ly with national socialism, but I think we understood our lesson and so why, why history for me is so important and this is a contribution hopefully to European citizenship as well. Well, if I may add before I skip out of the debate, two elements. One, uh, there are some countries where there's a clear priority. A member of the national parliament is much more important than a member of the European parliament. And if you have the chance, you run for the national parliament and only as an alternative you go, and this has to be changed. You have to change the political attitude towards your member of the European Parliament. The second issue, I think, which is important, is our translation of what we do to the citizen. If you listen very often, this is also, of course, for the media, but also for members, politicians. If we speak about, in our technicality, in our Brussels language and idioms and talk, People don't understand. If people don't understand, they will not be involved. So a very important is education is an element of it. But how want to educate or train people if you don't explain in simple terms what you do? We very often overestimate what people think or what people understand. And I think one, uh, I always appeal to myself and to the other colleagues, please speak in a way that people can understand and then they will follow you. Then they will also be engaged. Uh, for me, that's a very important point and we very often forget about that. Sorry I have to run to get my flight back to Vienna, but thank you very much for the invitation and uh, sorry for my colleagues to, to leave them alone, but they have more space to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think Jürgen Mittag would like to say something from an academic perspective as well. Just one additional thought that is also contributed to the question, but also what has been discussed on the panel over here. When we talk about European democracy, we have at least three different dimensions. We have the European political party groups in the European Parliament, we have national parties, and we have the European parties. And what I consider as particularly interesting is the composition, how things are merged. Of course, the political parties at European level are not that relevant, but the European Parliament has managed to integrate different kind of political 
parties within the political party groups in the European Parliament. That is what I tried to highlight. The Liberals, including central parties as liberal parties, at least for some time, the Christian Democrats and the Conservatives under one umbrella. And we can even see it with the Green Party. It's a strange composition of green parties or ecological parties and more um, regional parties in one party group in the European Parliament, but the structures seem, seem to be highly feasible to take up this kind of overall composition. And I think this is the strength of European democracy, but also a challenge to make the people know this kind of unique European composition. It's flexible to some extent. It's difficult to explain because we're talking about different stages and different levels of political will formation and decision taking, but it shows nevertheless a high ability of European democracy to come to consensus at the very end. And that is mirrored in the 70 years of political party groups over here in the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Jürgen Mitter, for these excellent final words, I think. Uh, I will now have to close this event. Uh, next year, we have the European elections, the next European elections. We don't know the outcome of the elections. Uh, there will definitely be changes in the composition, perhaps in the names of some of the groups. But there will very likely still be the transnational groups. So the transnational groups, I think, are very important, uh, not just from a perspective, political perspective, but also from a research perspective to understand the operation of the European Parliament. And they have achieved a fairly high, for the reasons that we've discussed, a high degree of continuity and stability. And so it remains to be seen, of course, what they will contribute to in the next legislative period in terms of the actual politics and policies of the European Union and the European Parliament in particular. And uh, we are already excited, can be excited now, I think, and can't wait to see uh, what exactly the outcome of these elections will be in terms of the, uh, their impact on the transnational groups in the European Parliament. So thank you very much to everyone who has participated online and everyone in the room, both current and former members and anyone else who has participated but particularly, of course, my thanks go to the three panelists, Hans de Vries, Hannes Roboda, who has just left, of course, and Hans Gerpöttering as former, today as former uh, chairs of their respective groups, and to Jürgen Mittag uh, for his excellent academic introduction to the topic. Thank you.